Bless the Lord everyone and welcome to another of our Bible studies. Um, in today's lesson or in today's Bible study we'll be looking at the book of 1 Corinthians. Um, but let us pray first. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your goodness and your mercies. We thank you for being here with us, O oh God. We trust that your spirit will lead and it will guide us into your truth. Lord, open up our understanding that we may understand the scripture. Help us, God, not just to be hearers of your word, but help us to apply them to our lives. Have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so today, as I stated before, we'll be looking at the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, to be um, exact. Um, and so we're going to be starting with the background of the book. And so there's a couple words that we use to, that gives a good picture of, you know, the, Cor the, the city of Corinth. Um, the first word is Aphrodite. Aphrodite, what is that? That is the god that the Corinthians worship. Um, they regard her as the goddess of love. They built her a temple, a, a huge temple. And, um, and in those temple, I'm sorry, in that temple, they had a thousand what they call temple prostitutes. And so you can imagine that their worship, a lot of their worship of this goddess um, was around sexual, was sexual in nature. And um, the, the next word we're going to look at to give us a picture of, you know, what the, Corinth, at, at what the city of Corinth was about is the word Corinthian. Now, we might think Corinthian was, you know, a person that comes from Corinth. But to be a Corinthian was to be a shameless desolate. It's to be a person that have little or no moral restraint and does, you know, whatever, you know, whatever sexual urges they, 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 they would feel. The next word we're going to look at is Corinthianized. Um, so now to be Corinthianized was to engage in a relationship with a prostitute. So if you in, engage in a relationship with a prostitute, then it is said that you have been Corinthianized. And so these words give you a good picture of the level of immorality and thus the degrading nature of the city of Corinth. It was, as I said before, it was a city that was heavily into idol worship. And this worship of the goddess Aphrodite actually, you know, corrupt, as it were, the entire city. Um, in terms of the book of Corinthians now, the, the book was written by Paul, as you know. It was written about A.D. 57. This was some 20 something years after um, Christ would have died. And it was written while the Apostle Paul was at Ephesus. The purpose of the book. The book was written primarily to correct certain disorders that was into in the church that they had written to Paul about. Um, and additionally, the book was written to answer questions that the Corinthians have. Um, so let us start by looking at um, 1 Corinthians chapter, reading 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 4 to 8. And it reads thus, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything he, enri he are enriched by him in utterance and in knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that he, he come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of the Lord 
Jesus Christ. Amen. So this was, um, as I said, this book was written by the Apostle Paul. And um, in his normal way, he would have greeted the Corinthians church. He would have um, identified himself as an uh, apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, um, and it is interesting, and we'll come to this, that the, um, the Corinthian was one of the few churches, actually, that challenged Paul's apostleship. And when we come to chapter 9 of the book of, Corinth, of, the book of Corinthians, we see where Paul had to be defending his apostleship. Amen. But let us start first by looking at the outline of the book. So this is the outline here. So it started off in, um, from, from, um, with, with a general reproof. Um, then it went into the division in terms of the division that was in the church. He looks at the discipline in, in the Corinthians church. He looks at certain disputes in courts that, that was happening. So he, he, he dealt with that issue. Defilement in the, wor in the world, um, he dealt with the resurrection, offering up to idols, and then he concluded in um, chapter 16. I don't we'll get thus far, but um, we'll see how far we can go. So let us um, continue. So the first thing we want to look at um, is in terms of, in chapter 1, um, Paul and the scripture that we have read, Paul greeted the church. And he is giving thanks to God. And he is giving thanks to God for, for one, the Bible says that um, in verse 5, he says that in everything ye are enriched by him in all utterances and in knowledge. And let us look at that for a while. Because Paul was saying, what Paul was saying was that God was enriched, or God has enriched the knowledge and the utterances of the Corinthians church. So when they open their mouth to speak, the words that come, come forth from them was not just their words, but God would have enriched it and give it substance. Amen. And he actually also speaks about the knowledge. God enrich their knowledge and give them, as it were, a greater understanding and I believe here, although the Bible didn't explicitly state it, I believe Paul was actually speaking about the gifts of the Spirit. When we look back at the gifts, and those are in Corinthians chapter 12, and hopefully we'll get to those, we see where there are some gifts that is categorized as gift of utterances, you know, um, and there are gifts that speaks to word of knowledge and word of wisdom. And so these are some of the ways where God was enriching these Corinthians um, the, in terms of their, their speech and their knowledge. And then he went on to make what I believe is a profound statement. He said that the Corinthian church was, was behind no church in terms of the gifts of the Spirit. And so that it is believed by scholars and generally by, by, by most persons that study the Bible that all of the gifts of the Spirit were being operated by at the Corinthians church. And that there was no church that was as gifted as, as, um, as, these, as, as, as these Corinthians were. Not only were, the, were all the gifts operating but in terms of the, the whole operation of his gift itself, you know, you know, the Bible speaks about measure in the gifts. There was no gift that, the, that you know, the, any other church has that was being operated in a, more, in a greater way than how it was being operated in the Corinthians church. In short, what am I saying here is that the Corinthians church was one of the most gifted church that we read about in the Bible. Amen? But when, and, and this is quite an irony. It is quite an irony. Because when you consider the Corinthians church, and when you consider the, 
the, you know, the, the, the language of Paul to the Corinthians church. You know, even in chapter 1, Paul went on now to actually um, to reprove or rebuke the Corinthians church and said that they are carnal. He said that they are carnal. And why did he say that they, they were carnal? Because there were division in the church. And there were some folks that saying that I am of Paul. And there are some other folks that were saying that I am of Cephas. And, and there are some other folks that were saying that I am of Apollos. And there were some folks that saying that I am of Christ. And Paul was saying that, look guys, you guys are divided. And you guys are carnal. You guys are carnal. And so, and, 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 and so it is quite ironic that one of the most carnal church that we have come across in the scriptures is also one of the most gifted church as it relates to the gifts of the spirits quite ironic and it it, it, it tells us a, a, a certain thing one it tells us that operating the gifts is not necessarily a sign of maturity and operating the gifts of the spirit is not necessarily you know it doesn't mean that you're there and that all is well you can be carnal as the corinthians church were and still speak in tongues and still work miracles and still operate the gifts of the spirit because the gifts of the spirit is exactly what it is said it is a gift it is not earned it's not something that god gives you as an approval of your your maturity and your growth no it's just a gift that god gives you and we're going to come to why god gives us those gifts um in a while amen so it is quite interesting that as i said that you know god flagged uh, Paul is flagging this church, this Corinthians church, as being one of the most gifted. And at the same time, Paul is saying that the church is also carnal. Amen. And then, um, and, 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 and so forth. And, and so what we're saying is that in terms of maturity, operating the gifts are not necessarily a sign of your maturity. Um, on the other hand, I believe that operate that if we that obtaining the fruit of the spirit is a, a better sign of maturity. Amen. And so when we look at some of the fruits, we looked at love, we looked at joy, we looked at peace, we looked at long suffering. These are some of the fruit of the spirit. And these are generally a sign, especially where love is concerned. This is really a sign. The Bible called love the bond of perfectness and so love and those other fruit of the spirit is is a better judge in terms of the maturity of a saint not how well he preach not how well he teaches or not how well you know or how often he speaks in tongues and so and and, and so let us look some more um at the what was happening in the Corinthians church in um, Corinthians chapter 2 um, and so let me just quickly read a portion of the scripture here in Corinthians chapter 2 Paul says I brethren when I came to you came not with excellency of speech or wisdom declaring unto you the testimony of God for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified and I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of, of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit uh, and of power. So here Paul is, uh, you know, he's saying to them that when he came to them, he did not use words, enticing words are persuasive words of men wisdom and you know it is quite interesting because when we look today at a lot of the quote-unquote favorite preachers a lot of these folks 
This is their method. This is their modus operandi. The use of enticing word. The use of men wisdom. You know, it come to a place where, you know, people are preaching now and they're not necessarily using the scripture anymore. They are, they are using all manner of things and they are just trying to excite the crowd and to get persons to be, um, you know, um, to please persons and it's like they are just in an entertainment mode. Um, but this, this was not Paul's method of evangelism. Paul knew that to have true impact, you must rely on the Spirit of God. Um, you know, Jesus said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And I know, I know what he's speaking about was in terms of being born again and all of that. But I do believe it does apply here also that the things that we come up with of our own mind and, you know, those, those, those methods that we use to evangelize that is just dealing with, you know, enticing words and just trying to excite person. Those are fleshly. And, they will not, and while they will excite the crowd and they will invite you to come back in terms of having a lasting impact, on the souls of humanity that those those are not how you know that is not that, that's not going to happen you know it is when we really and truly rely on the spirit of god that we will have um these um you know these impact and and so some persons ask why paul was such a great minister and why he was so impactful why he was able to win souls wherever he goes and why his ministry was so dynamic and different from everyone else. And now we, we are seeing why. Because he did not rely on his intellect. He didn't rely on his own strength. But he relied on the spirit of God. And his ministry was about the cross of, Cal of Jesus Christ. And his, you know, his tool was, as it were, to the, 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 the demonstration, as it were, of the power of the anointing or of the the spirit of god he didn't um and so paul didn't want to excite anybody he didn't want to win them to himself but he wanted to win them to christ because when we win person to ourselves this is what exact this is the exact thing that happened we will find people saying i am of paul and we will find people saying i am of apollos you know and but but when we preach the gospel, you know, in a way that Paul did, then we will end up winning people unto Christ. Amen. So despite their immorality, um, God had a profound love for the Corinthians. And we're going to look at this scripture in Acts 18 and verse 8 to 11. So Paul, he touched on it here in um, chapter 2. And he was actually giving his own testimony and he was saying that when i was with you for he said that um for i determined not to know anything of um, among you save jesus christ and him crucified and verse 3 said and i was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling this was apostle paul um and so we're going to look at acts chapter 18 and and verse um 8 to to 11 so this is paul and he was giving his testimony that while he was you know at corinth while while he was there to 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 minister and to actually start the church he had these challenges he was he was fearful he was saying and he was he had you know he, there was weaknesses and you might you might, you might wonder why i'm going to come to the scripture in acts chapter 18 um shortly uh, he says, I, um, I thank God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given to you in, um, by Jesus Christ. Next um, verse, please. Let me just turn to it here also in my Bible. So it's Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18, verse. 
Acts chapter 18, verse 8, it says, And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his hosts. And many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Then spake the Lord to, to Paul in the night by a vision and said, Be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace, for I am with thee. And no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. And so you notice that I started out by giving you the background of the Corinthian church, of the, sorry, of the Corinth, the city. And now, and now how immoral they were, how they were basically idol worship and they were you know, there was a lot of sexual immorality in that city. It was, a, it was a, v, a very sinful city. But yet we find God here. And this is something that I believe is unique to the Corinthians church. That God came to Paul and God said to Paul, Paul, look here. Um, you see, Paul had a rough time leading up to his... his um, reaching out to the Corinthians at, at, at Corinth. And um, in, in, in before he reached to, to Corinth, you know, he had traveled to some other location and he was, he was treated bad. He was roughed up as it were, physically. He was beaten. And he was, um, you know, and Paul, when he reached to Corinth, he um, somehow that was affecting him psychologically. It, you know, his body was bruised and all of that, but it had a mental impact on him also. And so he, in Corinthians two, he testified that he was, you know, he was um, he was in weakness and he was and there was fear and there was trembling because of, you know, of of what had would have transpired in the past. And here we find God. Because of those fear, because of those situations, and because God didn't want Paul to leave, God, the Bible said, God appeared unto him and said, Be not afraid, you know, um, but speak and hold not thy peace. And, he's, and God gave Paul a promise. God said, For I am with thee. Now, it doesn't mean that he wasn't with him all the time, but he, he, he was assuring, uh, giving him the assurance that he was with him now, and that no man shall set on thee. To hurt thee. So he was giving him his word that in Corinth, unlike other city, you know, he wouldn't be beaten, he wouldn't be flagged, he wouldn't be roughed up as it were. And the reason God God did that was as his um, as the scripture said, because he God has much people in this, you know, in this very immoral city. Which is another irony that a city is so immoral that God would testify and say, look here, I have many people here and I want you to stay here. And Paul stayed there a long time. I think the Bible said um, up to six months. I'm um, sorry, one, and, one year and six months, one and a half a year. Um, Paul stayed at Corinth because God had much people there in that wicked city and so it, it, it goes to show that where sin abound grace does much more abound and god god want to show that you know it doesn't matter we can't just look at somebody and say they are so they are far gone we can't just look at a city and say no this city is too bad you know god is god have people there and god is able to deliver his people amen and so this is the background that the Apostle Paul, you know, was writing in terms of his experience in the city of Corinth. And he went on to say, you know, um, I'm sorry, as I, was, as, as I was saying, despite their immorality, God had um, a profound love um, for the, 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 the city of Corinth. Paul spoke about how he was, uh, as I said, we, we went that already. Um, and so the spirit revealed the deep thing. So he, so, so he went on to speak about now that, you know, in terms of the spirit itself, that um, the, you know, we don't really speak of the wisdom of men 
and we don't use the 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 in terms of our own intellect but we rely on the spirit and here paul is saying that the the the, the spirit reveals what it were the deep things of god you know the scripture says that eyes have not seen and so none, none of us there's nothing that we have looked upon there's nothing that we have viewed that adequately describe um you know what god has in store for us he says eyes have not seen neither have her um ear you know uh, neither have anyone heard you know we, we we haven't heard it there's no there's no articulate minister there's no person that can put it in words for us to have shakespeare can't write it you know what god have in store for us neither the scripture say has it come into the heart of man we can't even imagine it we can't we can't think and ponder because our ma imagination is based upon what our eyes have seen and what our ears have heard and so we can't even create back that image as it were you know the things that god have in store for us eyes have not seen neither have have, have we hear, heard of it neither can we imagine it but the bible says but but god's spirit has revealed it unto us you know god's spirit has revealed it unto us and in in chapter 2 um paul speak about how that you know who knoweth a man you know um less the spirit of the man that is in him and what he was saying was that you know we all have a spirit in us we all have a spirit in us and that spirit that we have in us it's the true it truly knows us our, our wife doesn't really know us as much as she think she does our parents doesn't really know us as much as they think but that spirit that is within us that spirit truly knows us and so if the, if i could take out my spirit and give it to somebody then the person i give it to would know everything about me and would have all the knowledge of of me and paul was using this language and he was saying that so it is with christ you know there is a spirit that is in jesus christ and the spirit that is in jesus christ knows everything about christ it knows all about christ and if we could get that spirit of christ that knows everything about christ paul is saying then in it, it means then that we it, ourselves would know everything about christ and so when we actually receive the baptism of the holy ghost what we receive is that same spirit that was in christ or that is in christ that spirit that knows everything about him and so paul he conclude by saying you know we have been given the mind of christ so we, we 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 can know how christ will respond in our situation we we have been given the mind of christ and this is a wonderful a gift that the lord has given us so we can know everything about christ and not only about christ but we can know everything about what god has planned and what god has in store for us and he said that we have not given you the spirit of the world but he has given us the spirit of christ you see because he hasn't given us the spirit of the world that is why we really don't know or we can't we don't necessarily know the things of the world we don't necessarily you know can because people are saying the spirit of god is in you you know why you don't just use the spirit of god and become a millionaire well that's not why god give us the spirit the god didn't give us the spirit to give us knowledge about the world he gives us the spirit of christ to give us knowledge about christ so in chapter 2 paul was saying that you know he does not preach to excite he doesn't use um you know um words excellency of speech but he rely on the spirit of christ and he rely on the power that comes from the holy ghost and he present that as his method of evangelism 
Amen. So let us have a look at chapter 2. Chapter 3, rather. Let us have a look at chapter 3. So in chapter 3, Paul continued, and in fact, Paul kind of revisited and kind of doubled down on the fact that the Corinthians church were carnal. And he said, I, brethren, could not speak unto you as spiritual, but, uh, but unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. So Paul called the Corinthians babes. And you have to understand that this was very, um, this was like a slap in the face because they thought that they were so intellectual. They thought that they were so bright and so smart and they were puffed up as it were. You know, they were proud and they thought that, you know, they were all that. And Paul kind of burst their bubbles and said, look here, man, you guys are really babes. You know, you guys don't know what you're talking about. Um, he said, look here, you guys walk as men. And you might look at it and you might say, but, 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 you know, aren't we men? You know, what, what Paul means. He, you know, he said that you are carnal. <coughs> um, let, let's just read verse 3. He said, for ye are yet carnal. For, your, for where there is among you envy and strife and division, are ye not carnal and walk as men? So first thing I want to, to, to iterate, to, to, to underscore is that whenever there is strife, whenever there is uh, strife and envy, the Bible said that there is corruption and it is a sign of immaturity. It is a sign of lack of spiritual growth. And Paul knew this. And so Paul was saying that, look here, the reason why you guys have so many strife is because you are spiritually immature. You're not maturing as a Christian. You're not growing. You know, you, you, you think you're doing well because you can preach. And because you do some miracles, you think you're doing well. But Paul was saying, no, you're not doing well. And I can't even, I, can't, I have to kind of just, I can't even relate to you, you know, as spiritual to spiritual. You, I have to treat you like a babe. And I have to feed you with milk and not with meat. Because you can't really, um, um, you can't bear meat, you can't digest meat. You can't understand if, if, I, if I should go into the scriptures and really give you some meat, some hard thing to understand. You know, you can't really appreciate it because you are actually a babe in Christ. Right? So he went on and he, he let them know that, you know, you know not, don't, don't watch the gift. Don't watch the fact that, you know, you have your, your utterances, God is enriching them and you have knowledge from God. You know, when it comes to your maturity, Paul was saying, you're not as mature as you, as you think you are. Um, so he went on to look at the fact that, you know, how we should view ministers. You know, he's saying that we should view ministers as laborers with Christ. And notice, I want to emphasize that Paul says, laborers with Christ as opposed to laborers for Christ. A lot of us are cognizant of the fact that we should, you know, work for the Lord. We will work for Jesus to the, to the shadow fall. You know that song, right? A lot of us are cognizant of that. But God doesn't want us to be um, only working for him. God wants us to actually work with him. Right? God wants us to work with him. Um, and so Paul says that, you know, we one planteth and another watereth. But it, was, it is God that gives the increase. And he went on to say that, look here, he that planteth is nothing. Is nothing. Is nothing to plant. And the guy that watereth Paul identified that and said, that is really nothing to water. The real substantial thing there is to give the increase. And it's only God can give the increase. And so Paul was really, you know, putting it in context and letting people know that, 
they shouldn't really be divided so and you know be saying that you know I am of Paul and be you know we should really look to Christ amen and so um, the, 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 the next thing we want to look at here is the wisdom of this world is foolishness with, with God Amen. So Paul went on in trying to, and what Paul was trying to do here, he was trying to shift their, their focus and their thoughts. You know, because they were relying on the wisdom of the world, and they had some preachers apparently that was preaching that way. And, and Paul wants to shift their, their focus and put it on Christ. And so he says that the wisdom of the world is foolishness with God. You know, and that's, that is something that we need to look at. The wisdom of the world is foolishness with God. Think about the wise things. Think about the wise and the prudent men of this world. God is saying, all of them, they, and the wisdom that they have is really foolishness. And it does not really help you spiritually. And the wisdom that they have cannot take you out of this world. You know? And so he, he went on to, to speak about that God. He take the wise in his craftiness. That is found in Job chapter 5 and verse 13. In the interest of time, we won't go there. And, and again, the Bible says that God knows the thought of the wise. That they are vain. Solomon sums it up for us. And the Bible says Solomon give himself to experience this world and all that it has to offer. And, he, and because he was rich and have you know, money and what it took to do that, he said that there is nothing that his heart desire that he did not, you know, that he, he didn't give it to, give in to. And after he put himself through all that experience, he summed it up and said, Vanity of vanity. All is vanity and vexation of spirit. And so this is in essence what Paul was saying. That all the thoughts of this world is vain. All the things that you want to give your mind to, to reason it out, it is vain. It is better you give your mind to the Lord. It is better you give your thought to the scriptures and to the things of the Lord. Amen. And so he said that, he summed it up and he said, look here, don't glory in men. Don't glory in men. Because all things are yours. And we'll come to that. He's saying, don't glory in men, but glory in the Lord. And this is exactly what the Corinthians church were doing. They were glorying those eloquent speakers that they have. And they were, you know, and it, it was causing division. And Paul was trying to address that. And he said, look here, don't glory in men. Glory in the Lord. Look to Calvary. You know, the power of our salvation lies in what transpired at Calvary. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so this was summing up what we had said before. So we're saying that the division was caused by exalting leaders. And, and to address this, Paul reminded them that it was Christ that was crucified. It was Christ that was crucified. It wasn't any leaders. It wasn't, any, it wasn't Paul that was crucified. It wasn't Apollos. You know, it was Christ. There was also division caused by exalting human wisdom. And Paul, to address that, he said, look here, we preach Christ crucified. And that is the power of our salvation. Our power, the power of our salvation lies in Christ crucified. If wisdom of men could save us, then Jesus would not come and die. You know? And, 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 and why should we spend our time preaching about these wisdom of men if the power really lies in Calvary? We should really be preaching about Calvary. And he, he made another statement. He said, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach. And some folks look at this and say, you see, baptism was not important. But that's not what he was saying. Paul was just showing that he was really dedicated. And he was really committed 
to do exactly what Christ asked him to do. And, and, and Christ wanted him to preach. And so even though baptism is important and even though Peter 3.21 says that it is baptism that does save us and not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. And even though Mark 16 verse 16 says that, you know, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. You know, baptism is important and we can't be saved outside of baptism. But Paul did not baptize many of the Corinthians. He allowed someone else to do that. And he focused on what, you know, he was called to do, which is to preach the gospel. And here is a lesson, you know, that we should really focus and zoom in on our gifting and what God calls us to do. And, and if everybody does that, then nothing will be left undone. Amen. So let us uh, move on in terms of, um, excuse me. So just to elaborate uh, a, a bit more in terms of true wisdom, um, we said that true wisdom is imparted by the Spirit. Um, he wanted them to have faith in God's power. Paul's minister, ministry was not with enticing words of men wisdom. I say I'm just recapping what I did before. But by God's spirit and power. Um, and the reason, one of the reasons why he does it, other from the fact that it works and it has the power to save people. Other from that, he wanted, he, he wants their faith to stand not in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. So Paul wanted the Corinthians church to, to um, their faith as it were to stand in the power of God. They, he wanted them to believe in God. You know sometimes and you know I remember even when I just got saved you know we usually listen a lot of preaching cassettes because we were so, so zealous about God and we listen preaching cassettes. And you know sometimes when I got down you know, instead of praying and going to try and find God, you know, I said, I'm going to just go look to see if we can find another cassette so we can listen to it and it uplift my spirit. And it might sound humorous, um, funny, you know, but, but this is exactly what Paul was saying. He didn't want the, the, the Corinthians church to, to have faith in the wisdom of men and the eloquency of men and a man putting a message and blessing you and all of that. He wanted them to have me, um, their faith to stand in the power of the Almighty God. And so when anything wrong, they will go to God and pray and say, God, here am I. Help me. And so um, we looked at Paul's experience at Corinth already. We won't look at that in chapter 8 in, um, in Acts. Sorry, that should be Acts 8 in um, verse 8. Um, and we looked at the wisdom of God. We speak, you know, which speaks to, you know, the spirit reveal the deep things of God. So we can move on um, to the next slide. All right, let us, let us, yes, let us move on. All right, hold on, go back. You can, yes. So, um, so Jesus, so we looked at, we looked at some things on this side already. We looked at, uh, at Paul called the Corinthian church babes. And, and, you know, we underscored that, that where envy and strife was, there was also division. And it was a sign of spiritual imma, Im, um, immaturity. Um, even though they were operating all the gifts, they were spiritually immature. Um, and we looked at the fact that we should be laborers in Christ. Um, but Paul went on to say that, you know, that Jesus is the foundation. Jesus is the foundation. Paul described himself as a master builder and he laid Christ as the foundation. And so as, 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 as builders, you know, we can go and lay another foundation. The foundation is already laid and we have to build on that foundation. Um, but Paul was saying that, you know, Christ guide us and if we should follow Christ then we should understand what our effort and what our dedication should be because Christ he, he gave us the example and so if we should follow him then we should we, we will be building 
with material that are you know gold and and silver you know that won't vanish that won't burn when they are tried um, by fire so Paul so Paul was saying you know Jesus is the foundation and that Christ himself and that we should build upon this foundation and our work or our effort you know will be will be judged and some of them will be like gold some of them will be like silver others will be like brands that will not perish when it is tried by fire but then there's also those that will be like wood and and and, and stopple you know that will burn and ignite and be destroyed when they are tried by fire and so but if we should follow christ and if we should be as devoted as he was and if we should make the sacrifices that he makes and if we should really put God first in our lives and our motive is, 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 is that of love, then we can be assured that the material that we are building with is, will be good. Right? He went on to, to speak about that, uh, or to remind the Corinthians church that their body was the temple of God. Their body was the temple of God. And we have to understand this. And sometimes, because we hear it so many times, you know, it doesn't hit us as it, as, as it, as it should because we are familiar with the, the phrase. But if you can go back to the Old Testament and if you can look at the type of reverence that God demands for the temple that he resides in and, and what they have to do and how they have to treat it with the level of respect, if we can bring that and, and transform it to, 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 to us here and know that your body is really the temple of God and the same type of reverence that they would have for the Old Testament physical temple because and the reverence was there, I, I was required because the presence of God was there. You know, it, it, will, it will go... It will, if we should do that, then it will go far in having us understand the type of reverence you should have for your own body, the temple of God. And just to quickly remind you that there was this guy that, I think his name was Uza, that he reached out to touch the Ark of the Covenant. Now the Ark of the Covenant was, a, was, was an Ark that was made and, the, and you know the Spirit of God dwells there. And, and that's what gave it its sacredness. And, and this man reached out to touch it. And lawfully so. Because he knew that he was not allowed to. And it's just the priest should, should handle it. And God killed him. And you know. And, 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 and again. It, it, it underscores the point that I'm making. That you know. The type of reverence. The type of um, fear that we should have for our body because it is a temple of the living God. He went on to say that if any man defile the temple, then God will destroy him. Just like how he destroyed um, Uzzah. Okay? So let us, move, let us look now at chapter 4 of Corinthians and see what Paul is saying here. So, so far, you know, we, we, we see where the Corinthians church were exalting the leaders, some leaders, and, and on to the point of almost worshipping them. And so in chapter 4, Paul gave us the, how we should treat our leaders, and how we should treat, sorry, not our leaders, how we should treat our ministers. And, and let me just read um, from chapter 1, he said, it's he, um, wrote, sorry, Corinthians chapter 4. Paul said, Let a man so account of us. So he was talking about the apostles as of the ministers of Christ and steward of the mysteries of God. So he was now giving them, you know, how they should view leaders. And he used the word minister. He said, Let a man so account of us as minister. And when we, when we look at the root word for that, he was talking about being a servant. 
You know, it's really a word that speaks to a, an individual that is subordinate. And so Paul was saying, this is how you should view us as a servant of God. You know, and he went on to say, and stewards of the mysteries of God. And the, again, the term that he used is a humble term. Steward is really a humble term. It's a humble terminology. It, 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 I think it's referred to those persons that would have um, been in charge of the storehouse. So, so if, a, if a household has a, you know, a farm, and then they would have a storehouse that they would keep their farm supply, you know, and these, the person that is in charge of that storehouse would be the steward. And so these were humble terms that Paul used to, and he's saying that this is how you should view ministers, you know, as stewards of the mysteries of God and as servant. Paul was very deliberate in being, um, in not being exalted above measure. Um, and so he went on now to, to address those that thought they were special, you know, that thought they were special, that thought that, you know, they were different. And he said, he asked them a question. He said, who makes you to differ? Or who makes you different? And then, and he asked them another question. He said, what have you that you did not receive? And it is interesting because when it comes to, to God and when it comes to the church, if you earn it, it is of no value. If you work for it, it is of no value for the church. The things that are most relevant, the things that are most valuable, the things that are most impactful for the church is the things that we received from God. And so Paul was making the point that, so one, if you earn it, it's, not, it's, it, it's really of no value. And then now, if it is then that you didn't earn it, but you receive it. For example, the gifts that we have, we receive them. Then why are you behaving as if it was by your own effort you, you, you were doing it? If you are working miracle, why are you puffed up because you're working miracle? You can't just work miracle of your own effort. It was a gift that was given to you by God. If you are if you are able to divide the word, you know, why are you puffed up because of that? There's no need to be puffed up. Paul is saying that look here, if it was given to you, you know, then then you don't need to be puffed up about it. Because it was a gift. Okay? He went on to say that um you know that god has set forth and further speaking about the apostles you know that the past that the apostles were weak he said that they were fools he said that they were defamed as it were you know they had no certs no no certain dwelling place so you have to look at the spirit of what he was doing he wasn't and he said it in the scripture he wasn't trying to shame them are to belittle the apostles, but he just wanted them to know that look here, you shouldn't be worshiping us. You shouldn't be worshiping us. Because this is you know, this is who we are, this is what we're doing. We're just ministers of Christ. Next slide, please. So in chapter five, in chapter five of the book of Corinthians. Paul deals with the subject of incense. And um, you know the story well. There was this guy that had sexual relationship with his father's wife. I believe. If going by memory. Right? And um and 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 Paul said, Paul made a statement. He said that. You know, they are puffed up and, um, and, and in, instead they should have turned this man over to, the, to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. And I wonder, and, and I look and I'm saying, what, what does that mean? You know, turn this man over unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that the spirit 
shall be saved. And, and we find that in 1 Timothy 1, I think, verse 20, Paul also made the statement um, as it relates to um, Hymenus and Alexander. He said um, that he turned them over unto Satan, you know, for the destruction of the body so that the spirit shall be saved, or the destruction of the flesh, rather, so that the spirit sh um, shall be, be saved. Um, a lot of persons are not sure exactly what these terminology mean. However, we are guided by two things. One, you know, we are guided by that last statement that says that he wants the spirit to be saved. And so ultimately, he wasn't just casting them out and he wasn't just throwing them out. Um, if you remember with Job, Job, um, the devil came and asked God if he, you know, to touch Job, to tempt Job. And God literally, as it were, placed Job in his hand with some restriction, as it were. And, and so some scholars believe that this is a similar thing that he was speaking about here. You know, where God would remove that natural covering. Hallelujah. That God will remove that natural covering that we have as Christians. And will allow the devil to actually come in and buffet or to come in and, you know... Um, um, persecute us as it were. You saw what he did to Job, how he took away, how he killed his children, how he took away his stuff, and how he afflicted his body with sores. And so, you know, some scholars believe that this was what, this was a, a similar thing that Paul was speaking of in terms of, you know, handing over him to the, for, the, for the devil to buffet him so that he could return to God with a true heart. You know, so it's not to destroy his soul, but in fact, it was in love that you should actually turn somebody over to Satan so that his spirit shall be saved. When you look at it all from the outset, and you might wonder why sometimes we have to read somebody out of the church, as it were. You know, this again is something that some persons view here, you know, that it actually could be applied to reading them out of the church, you know, asking them to leave, and then putting them out there so that natural covering that we have would have been removed, and Satan would come in and, 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 really, te and really persecute them. And, 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 and so at the end of the day, Paul was saying that this is what this man needs. This is the, probably the only thing that could help him to truly come back to God. In verse 6 of chapter, sorry, in chapter 6 of Corinthians, Paul dealt with um, the, the, the subject about going to law to, to the heathen court. And, you know, he said that, you know, how, how could you bring your brother to court um, before the unjust judge? Um, Paul reminded us that saints are to work out their problem among themselves. So God wants us to work it out in the church. You know, Paul said, look here, is there not a wise man among you that could judge uh, between the issue? You know, God wants us to work out our issues in the church and not to take it before the unjust judge. He, Paul reminded us that, you know, we are going to be a, we are going to judge angels. And so we should feel competent to judge, you know, between these little issues that we are having um, among ourselves. Um, he, Paul also, you know, he, he actually rebuked both person. And this is interesting. Paul rebuked both person. Paul rebuked the person that was wrong. And he said, look here, you're wrong. How can you defraud your brethren? Um, how can you do that? And you say you're a Christian. So he rebuked the individual that was wrong, that defrauded his brother. And he said, you know, don't you know that no unrighteousness shall enter into the kingdom of God? But not only did he rebuke the person that was wrong, he also rebuked the person that was defrauded. And Paul said, look here, the man defraud you. And you take the man to court. Why you never just rather suffer loss? You should have, it would have better for you to suffer loss than to take the man to court and um, before the unjust judge and so that unsaved 
can laugh about Christians and say, look here, them say them are Christians and, and look what is happening. And so Paul rebuked them both and, 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 um, and, 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 and said, look here, deal with these matters inside the church. He also went on in further in chapter 6 to, 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 to talk about sexual immorality. He reminded us that not because something is lawful does not mean it is expedient. So, you know, you might say nothing is wrong with this. And true, nothing is wrong, might be wrong with it. But not because it is lawful, it doesn't mean that you have to do it. It doesn't mean that it is necessary. It doesn't mean that you have to bring yourself under the power of it. He went on to speak about meat for the belly and the belly for meat. Um, um, that scripture is speaking about the fact that as, as a human being, as a man, we have this desire to eat uh, meat. And the you know, and meat is good for the body. You know, that's what he's talking about. Meat for the belly and the belly for meat. He, he went on to say, God will both destroy both it and them. So there's come a time when this physical body is going to be destroyed. You know, this physical body that consume meat is going to be destroyed. And that desire for meat is also going to be destroyed. But he reminded us that our body is not for fornication. You know, but our body is the temple of God. And he said that God will both, you know, God, sorry, our body is for the Lord. And that God will raise up, uh, sorry, God raised up the Lord and he will raise up our body also. Um, so he, he, he encouraged us that um, we should flee fornication. He said, what? Know he not that your body is the temple of God. And so we should, again, it comes back to the point about giving that temple of God the respect that is due. Because it is, a, as it were, a treasure in earthen vessel. You know, that we have, that spirit of God that is within us is a treasure that we have. And so we should not just treat it lightly. Um, you know, but we should actually... Um, um, flee fornication as the Bible says all the sins that we do you know God made a special uh, Paul is making a special effort here or you know a, a special case as it were to flee fornication and what he's saying is that whatever other sins that we commit we commit outside of our bodies you know, but when we commit fornication, we commit it. It it is with, within our bodies, and so it makes it. I know a person said no, no sin is greater than any. I'm I'm not sure about that, but here Paul is underscoring the point that we should flee from fornication. Amen. So let us uh, look at quickly look at chapter seven. We're just gonna go through quickly these other chapters. So in chapter 7, Paul speaks about marriage. And he, he, he proposed that, you know, it is better to marry than to burn. And he proposed that, you know, of course we don't really marry and most people don't get married because they, want to, they are fleeing fornication. But Paul says, look here. He proposed it as a remedy for fornication. So, you know, instead of committing fornication, it better you go and get married. And he reminded the folks that are married that, you know, marital obligation should not be, we, sh we should not defraud each other. We shouldn't withhold, you know, um, our marital duties uh, from our spouse. But we should, um, because if we do that, we are, we are allowing the devil an opportunity to tempt them in that regard. And so Paul encouraged us to, you know, not to do that. Um, in, the, in the closing part of chapter 7, he reminded us that we are, he encouraged us to live as how we are called. He said that if we are called being circumcised, you know, we shouldn't seek to be uncircumcised. And if we are called being circumcised, you know, we should remain that way. Yeah.
Okay, so in in ver in chapter eight, Paul is dealing with idols, um, things offering to idols, and the way he starts it is interesting because he started out by saying in verse one that no as touching things offered unto idols. We know that we are all we, we all have knowledge um sorry knowledge puffed up but charity edify it right he made another statement and said if, and if any man think that he knoweth any anything he knoweth nothing as he ought to know but if any man love God the same is known of him it's kind of strange and it's, it kind of even don't even as it look as it relates to 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 idol is because in in verse one he said no one's touching things offered unto idols um we know that and um we know that we all have knowledge and then he went on to say knowledge puffed up but charity edified so paul says that so he made this statement he said that knowledge puffed up but love edified he went on to say if if you think you know anything or if you think you are knowledgeable, you really don't know nothing as you ought to know it. But if, and then he went on to say, but if any man love God, he is known of God. Um, he went, um, so we know that an idols are nothing and there is only one God. Right? So we know that. Um, however, Paul, what Paul was saying was that, and why he actually, I believe, why he actually quoted those other scriptures before why he made those statements before is because these folks were knowledgeable they were saying well we know that there is no such thing as idols so we can go ahead and eat these things and fine and that is true but now they were their knowledge would say that okay even if the thing is offered to idols i can eat it because there's no true idols fine but there were people now that was looking on. Their brothers and sisters were looking on and seeing them eat things offered to idols. And they were being destroyed by it. Their faith were being destroyed. It was affecting them. It was affecting them, their spirituality. You know, it was affecting their walk with God. And Paul was saying to them, look here, if you really have love, you would have judged for yourself and love would dictate to you that you shouldn't eat the thing before your brother if it is destroying him. And so I believe this is what he was saying here, you know, that love edified and knowledge puffed up. And, 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 and so Paul, he went and he made a statement to say that if, me, if, if I will not eat meat, you know, if, if eating meat caused my brother to be offended and and again as i said paul was he was he was letting us know that and he was saying you know in a roundabout way as it were that really if you truly have love then you would have understand this and you wouldn't be eating meat before your brother even though you know that it is destroying him you would have you would have love would have dictate to you that you should not be doing that you know and so paul actually um rebuke them for that and he was saying well fine you can eat your meat even though it's offered up to idol but don't do it before your brother because in doing it before your brother and because your brother is weak and you know he's not as knowledgeable as you you are destroying him and you should have really understand that of your own and you know and, and, and apply love and, 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 and not destroy this man for which Christ has died. Amen. So let us move on now to Acts chapter 9 quickly. So in Acts chapter 9, we find, sorry, in, 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 um, in Corinthians chapter 9, we find that Paul is defending his apostleship right and paul paul is defending his apostleship because there were some persons at corinth and because paul was rebuking them and paul was was speaking out against the 
immoral things that they were doing. They challenged Paul's apostleship and said, boy, you're not really an apostle. You know? And in doing that, they were saying, we don't have to hear you. And a lot of time, you find this. We find that when you confronted somebody with the truth, you know, they will, they will question your authority. And they will come against you in terms of, you know, you know, why are you saying this to me? You don't need to be saying this. You don't have the right. And so this is what they were doing. They were questioning Paul's apostleship. And Paul had to defend his apostleship. Um, he went on, he, he started out by saying, am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have, I, have not I seen Jesus Christ, our Lord? Um, are not he my work in the Lord? So, so they, they, are, they are questioning his apostleship. And they're saying that, Paul, you know, you're not really an apostle. You and Barnabas are not really an apostle. And Paul point back to them and said to them, look here, if I be not an apostle to other men, certainly I am an apostle to you. Because the church that was started in Corinth, this church, the church at Corinthians, this is the seal of my apostleship. In me, me establishing this church under God was a testimony that, you know, I am an apostle. So he actually used them to say, you know, they're saying, look here, Paul, you're not an apostle. Paul said, well, if I wasn't an apostle, you would not have been in the church. So he defended his apostles in a, in, in, a, in a very smart way, as it were. He defended his right to be supported um, in the church. So Paul asserted that he could get married. So he said, you know, I could get married. I could lead about a sister, a wife. You know, he said I could give up working or forbear working just like the other apostle and Cephas. I could have done that. And he shows from scripture that the scripture said you should not muzzle the oxen that tread it out the corn. And he asked the question, does God care about oxen? No, God doesn't care about oxen. But he was really speaking about the ministers that will thread out the corn as it were. That will minister to you spiritual things. And he was saying that you, well basically the oxen would be in the farm, in the field. And he would be plowing the field. And some people would put a, a muzzle around his mouth so that he could not eat any of the produce of the field. But God said to the Israel, don't do that. Remove the muzzle and so that he could eat anything he wants as he treaded out the corn. And Paul was saying that even though back then this was, this was, um, this was spoken as it relates to Israel and as it, is, as it relates to a physical oxen and a physical field, um, Paul was saying that this was actually it has a spiritual um, fulfillment and it is really speaking about the, 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 the ministers of God in this New Testament age and that the minister should really live off the church as it were. The pastor should really live off the church to be exact. You know, and he went on to make the case and say who goeth a warfare and is on his own charge so that a soldier does not Go if I'm if I'm if I'm enlisted in Jamaica Defense Force and Jamaica Defense Force is going up against Trinidad um, in terms of war, you know, I don't, I don't, um, I don't, I can't, um, I can't, I'm not expected to fund my myself. I am not expected to be the one to purchase my army fatigue and to purchase my gun and whatever I need to go to war. I am not, can't foot that bill. Paul is saying that that is not how it works. A soldier doesn't fit, foot his own bill, but he allow, you know, but, but whoever call him to war, take care of his expenses. And so he was saying that in the terms of the minister, that the minister is really at war for Christ and for God and his and, and, and so, in essence, the church should really handle his expenses. 
Um, so that's a point he was making. Um, and, and he said it here. God has ordained that they which preach the gospel should live from it. Right? But, but Paul said that he, he has not used any of these things. So Paul said, you know that Paul had a 9 to 5. Well, maybe it wasn't a 9 to 5, but he had a job. He had a job where he worked and he earned and he was able to take care of himself. He was a tent maker by trade. And he does this, as it says here, um, so that, you know, glory in preach, so that he could glory in preaching the gospel without charge, as it were. Um, he made himself servant of all men you know though he be free from all men and so paul made the point that you know in in terms of in terms of i am an apostle just like any one of you um any other, other apostle he's saying i am an apostle and i deserve to be treated as an apostle and other apostles require them you know require that you take you take care of their finances and that i have that Re, re, um, you know, obligation also. I, you know, I, I, you should really take care of my finances. But Paul said, you know, but I don't want that. He said he doesn't want that. He and he's not writing so that this thing could be done to him. But he was just writing to lay it out as the truth, as it was the truth, and that is how it should operate. But Paul said he gives up all of that so that he can preach the gospel for free, as it were, and he finds that that is kind of what he's glorying. Because he's saying that, you know, the dispensation of preaching the gospel is laid upon him. God called him to preach. Woe be unto him if he doesn't preach. And so he's not going to get any reward, as it were, for preaching. But he was saying that when he preach and does not, you know, and make it for free, then that is where he delights in. Uh, that is what he delights in. Um, so here again, in the ending of chapter 9, um, Paul admonish us, admonishes us to show um, self-restraint in all things. Um, he went on to say that, you know, we should run so that we can obtain. All run in a race, you know, but only a few persons, only one, receive the prize. And Paul says that we should run so that we should be that one that received the prize, as it were. He wasn't, he wasn't saying that we should compete against each other, but he was uh, speaking about our attitude. Um, if you look at a runner, a runner is very temperate in everything, you know, he eats and all of that. Um, and his lifestyle, he does not entangle, he doesn't entangle himself with anything. And again, a soldier does not entangle himself with the affairs of this world. Um, so that he can be a good soldier. So Paul is using those things and saying that, you know, we should um, be likewise. Amen. Next slide. So in chapter 10, and as we are, we are coming down now, in chapter 10, um, he's saying that we should learn from Bible history. So, Chapter 10 start like this. Moreover, brethren, I would not that he should be ignorant. Paul always don't want us to be ignorant. How that all our fathers were under the cloud and, and all passed through the sea and they were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And so Paul was saying that these folks, our fathers, they were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. In the cloud, we're speaking about um, being baptized with the Holy Ghost. In the sea, we're talking about being baptized in water. These were the, the types and the shadows that are, are here, are being revealed. And he went on to say they all, they did all, all of them did eat of the same spiritual um, food. And all of them, they did drink the same spiritual drink, you know. They all had the same experience. They were all baptized. You know, they all received the gift of the Holy Ghost, so to speak. They all, re they all read the Bible. And the same people preach to them. 
But the Bible said many were overthrown in the wilderness. And Paul was now saying that these things were written for our admonition so that we should not be idolaters. Um, as you know that many were idolaters and, and were destroyed of God. They, he warns us that we should not be fornicators um, because there was those that were fornicators and were also destroyed of God. He said that we should not tempt God as many of them also tempt God and were destroyed. And neither should we murmured, murmur because many of them murmured and were also destroyed of God. And so Paul was saying that um, don't let anybody fool you that once saved, you're always saved. No. Here we find that these people, these folks were saved. They were baptized. They received the gift of the Holy Ghost in types, as it were, because now I am I'm, I'm looking at the antitype as it relates to us. They're being baptized unto Moses. We're just talking about being baptized on, um, in Jesus' name. They're receiving the Holy Ghost was akin to, you know, receive... Um, receiving the baptizing in the cloud and the sea and they all did drink the same spiritual drink they they, they got food from christ as it were um but the scripture says that god destroyed many of them because of the things that they do so let us not fall into that temptation he at the closing of um chapter 10 um paul admonished us that you know, there is no temptation taken us. That all temptation are common among man. And so that there is no unique temptation to you. And the things that you go through, you know, I, I sometimes wonder if anybody is tempted with the things that I am tempted with. But the Bible reminds us that it is common to man. That our brethren throughout the world are going through similar temptation. And that, you know, and they, are, and they are bearing it so that you are able to bear it also. And he went on to say that God is faithful and that the Lord will not allow you to be tempted above that which you are able to bear. So God knows all of our limits. God knows that our, our, our age and stages, as it were, and, and our spiritual growth and development. He knows us. He knows he knows where our tipping point is and he will not allow us to be tempted above that point and so that we can rest assured that if god allow us to be tempted in a certain manner it is because he knows that we are able to bear it and so we don't have to say we can't bear it anymore or we can't bother but we know that you know god is god god won't tempt us above our measure and he will, as it were, with the temptation, provide a way of escape. Not that we might escape the temptation, but that we are able to bear the temptation. Amen. Um, so let us quickly go into chapter 11. Um, we, we, we won't spend much time here. In, in chapter 11, um, Paul reminded the church that they, they should wear a head covering for females, uh, a male praying or prophesying with his head covered dishonoreth God because God is his head, while a female praying and prophesying with her head uncovered dishonor her head, which is uh, the man. Um, he touched on the Lord's Supper and he says that, you know, in terms of the Lord's Supper, he rebuked them and saying that there were some folks that was coming to church and they were taking their own food. And they were, just before they eat the Lord's Supper, they would be eating their own food. And Paul asked them and said, look here man, you guys, you don't have your own house to eat. Why are you come and eating at the house of God and shaming those that don't have anything to eat? So Paul says, you know, he didn't want them to operate like that. But they should really eat at their house. Um, in terms of Lord's Supper, he also reminded them that, you know, we should judge ourselves um, whether we are worthy before we partake of the Lord's Supper. Because if we 
partake of the Lord's Supper unworthily, then we would be um, bringing damnation or we'll be eating and drink, drinking damnation, um, being not worthy of the blood and the body of Christ. And so he warns, he warns us in that reg regard. Okay, so we are going to be closing with chapter 12 now. And so let us just quickly look at chapter 12. So in chapter 12, he, he, deals, he dealt with the spiritual gifts. Um, he says that the gifts are the work of the spirit. And he, he said so, the, the, he made a couple of statements before he went into the gift. He says, um, no man speaking by the spirit of, of Christ called Jesus a curse. So these are just some general rules. So you can't tell me that you're prophesying. And in prophesying, you are calling Jesus a curse. You know? He said, he said, no man, he said, no man speaking by the by the spirit call it Jesus a curse. And so and so here um we may look at it and say, Well, nobody really wouldn't be doing that. But sometimes we don't sometimes we don't um do it intentionally. You know, sometimes when we consider what is said and, you know, we, 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 we follow the chain of thought, you know, down the road we recognize the implication is that you will be calling Jesus a curse. And so Paul warns us that. And he, he says, no man can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Spirit of God. Um, so Lord really means boss here, um, and so you can't really truly say that Jesus is your your boss, your your Lord, um, and unless you are being inspired by the Spirit of Christ. You remember Peter say um, that when Peter said, "Thou art the Christ, uh, the Son of the Living God," Jesus said to him, "Look here, Peter, you are blessed because flesh and blood." have not revealed this unto you but thy father and so it comes back down to that you know to really have that true conviction about christ it takes the the, the, the spirit of god and so uh, let us move to the next slide in the interest of time and so these are the gifts that paul looked at in um corinthians chapter 12 and i have arranged them based on some categories here so the first three we arrange those in terms of gift of revelation. And those are word of wisdom, word of knowledge, and discernment of spirit. Um, the other list, we list those, our scholars rather list those as being gifts of power. And the, the three gifts that fall in that category is faith, working of miracles, and gift of healings. And the final category is gift of utterance. And for that we have prophecy, following that gift, deserve, um, different kind of tongues, and interpretations of tongues. And so let us quickly move on to just a, just a brief description of what these um, gifts mean. So in terms of word of wisdom, word of wisdom is a supernatural declaration of the wisdom of god so one person put it this way it is a word that is spoken that has behind it the wisdom of almighty god and so this is not god giving you all his wisdom or this is not god giving you wisdom like how he gives um um solomon wisdom no but it is somebody will, will may come to you and and ask you something and you just speak a word god gives you a word and when you speak the word you know you just speak a word to them but the word that you speak it has behind it the wisdom of almighty god and when the person receives that word it just clear up everything in a way that you don't even imagine it would and it's and it's, it has nothing to do with you as it were it has nothing to do with your intellect and your wisdom but it's a word that god drops in your spirit has behind it the wisdom of the almighty god that minister unto people and it is said that a lot of people that is that is involved in counseling have these are uh, you know this this word of wisdom 
Um, there's a difference between word of wisdom and word of knowledge. Um, wisdom is somebody explain wisdom as being um, wisdom as the use of knowledge. And so they are again so the, so the, the, in the interest of time we won't get too much into that. But in terms of word of knowledge, this is a word again that is spoken that have behind it the knowledge of the Almighty God. Um, you remember when Paul was shipwrecked um, uh, just before Paul was shipwrecked, he was able to speak a word to the people about the situation. And he said to them, look here, don't go because if you go, you're going to be, you know, they're going to be lost, a lot of lost to the ship and, and to the cargo. And they, and they were going by their own natural wisdom and they were saying, but when we look at the sky, you know, the sky is not saying that any storm is going to happen. And we are experienced sailors, so we should know. And they went out. But again, you see that it, it actually happened as Paul um, said it would. But the point is that the word of knowledge, again, is a word about a situation. It's not having knowledge about God generally. But it's a word that we speak that in it, it has the, the knowledge of Almighty God. And it is able to help. Um, the, the, the next one we want to quickly look at is discernment of spirit. Now discernment of spirit is not the ability to know other people's business. But it is the ability to know who or what is influencing someone. And so there are three spirits that influence us. One, there is our own spirit that will influence us. There is the spirit of the devil or demons. And there are many demons, not just one. There are, and so, so that is another source. And of course, there is the Spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit that influences us. So the person, with, the person with discernment of spirit is able to discern which of these spirits is influencing that person. So when someone gets up and speaks, he's able to tell, is this person speaking of self? Or is this person being inspired by a demonic spirit? Or is it the spirit of the Lord that is, um, that is behind what he's saying or his action? So this is what discernment of spirit is. And it is a very sought after gift. More, a lot of folks seem to get this one. Well, I am not one of those folks. But let us move on to the next one. Um, the next set... The next set, and I'm getting the wrap-up signal, the next set is the gifts of uh, power, and faith falls in that one, and faith is, um, the gift of faith is the, just the ability to believe God under very diffi difficult circumstances, and you're able to not only believe God, but you're able to inspire belief in the church or in other people, um, you know, to believe God. Um, you know, one person, it is believed that Pastor Doe, I have this gift and you know when he came and he wanted that that land next door you know how he actually does he just inspired our faith under God and let us believe and went on three days fast and we were able to get the land something that we have tried and it didn't work before but by but by that that faith you know um, that belief in God in difficult situations we were able to get it Working of miracles. Now, um, and what is a miracle? A miracle is anything that goes against the natural law. So think about the natural law that we have. Anything that goes against the natural law is um, a miracle. And so this person has that ability that if God wants, when God wants, because all the gifts are channeled for the Holy Ghost. And so when God wants, he's able to, to actually... Um, use this person to work a miracle um one miracle that is um there are many miracles in the bible one of them is when um is when um philip was actually translated that's a very common one that a lot of time we use healing is the next thing that we're looking at healing um healing is said that so the body does have a mechanism that heals itself and so um, generally doctors doesn't really heal you but what they do is promote um, or provide an environment that the natural healing within the body can occur um, however miraculous healing is normally done um, it is normally instantaneous normally there are some cases where it probably wasn't um, we won't get into that now because of time and it is complete and it is permanent um, and, and, and so a person with this Gift is normally to lay hands or, you know, 
lay hands and, and to pray for somebody that their, their sickness will be healed. Um, and, he, and notice it is pluralized. It is healings because it is believed that there are different types of healing. Physical, spiritual, and emotional. Um, let us quickly look at this last slide. Um, the gift of utterance. So we know about prophecy. Um, prophecy is delivering a, a message um, that is received directly from God. So normally this is verbatim. It is it is, it is, it is verbatim in the sense that God literally gives you the word and you just, you, your body become a conduit. God takes control of your tongue and you speak, um, thus say the Lord, and God is actually in control of your, your vocal faculty and what you're speaking is coming from the throne of God and it has nothing to do with your mind. It has nothing to do with your thought process. God bypass all of that and speak directly through you. It's just like he borrows your tongue and speaks through you. So that is prophecy. It can be foretelling and it can be foretelling. Um, as I said, interest of time. We won't get too much into these. Um, then there is the one about different kinds of tongues. Um, different kinds of tongues. Uh, this is the ability when God wants to send a message to the church. He will use this individual and this individual will get up and deliver the word but the word is delivered in tongues and so the church does not understand it but but that is that the, this gift it is delivering a message to the church or to a group of people or to the saints in tongues not in your native language and so when when so this gift work with the other gift which is the interpretation of tongues and when and what happened now is that and normally it is it is not the same person it is it is not encouraged that the same person that give the message in tongue should be the same person that interprets it it can happen but we're saying it's not encouraged normally say somebody else um that gets up and and provide the interpretation and so interpretation of tongue is the other gift that we're looking at and in with this gift the person literally interprets under God and under the influence of the Spirit, interpret what is said by that individual that have the gift of um, tongues. Um, and so we have to run through these. We didn't get a chance to go through them, um, you know, in detail. But I believe you have an understanding of the gifts. And so these are the gifts that Paul um, um, discussed in chapter 12. And thus in wrapping up, um, this lesson in, um, in Corinth, he went on to, to speak about, um, in chapter 13, he speaks about love. And I, I can't even close without touching this. Because the Bible says that, you know, even if you desire, after he has given all of these gifts, he said, there is a more excellent way. And this is the way of love. And love is the thing that makes these gifts effective. Love is the thing that gives you the true power and, and um, that lies in these gifts. And so when we read chapter 13, as I said, time will not allow us to get in it. When we read chapter 13, we see, you know, where Paul say that, look here, if, if, you, are prophes if you are prophesying and you're not doing it in love, as was happening, as could be happening in the Corinthians church, because as I said, all the gifts were being manifested in the Corinthians church. So Paul was saying that, look here, if you are prophesying and you're not mature spiritually to be displaying love, then it's really nothing. It's really, you're really nothing. You're really nothing at all. Um, and then in closing, he says, now abide these three, faith, hope, and charity but the greatest of these are charity and i say in the interest of time we won't be able to get into some of these things however um the book of corinthians is a good book and i think you should really spend the time and even research some of these things in more detail than that i was able to go through um i want to thank you for joining us in bible study today and just let us close with a quick prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you again for your words. We thank you for your words, O oh God. David said that they were a light unto his feet 
and a guide unto his path. Lord Jesus, your words are so wonderful. They are marvelous. And we thank you for your words, God. We thank you for what you have done here today. We pray, O oh God, that we will hide it in our hearts so that we may not sin against you. O oh God, have your own way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So that is it. Thank you for joining and enjoy the rest of your night.